and look at this, all of a sudden, early, Paul Krugman on the Young Turks. Of course, he's a New York Times op-ed writer and the author of this excellent new book, The Conscious of a Liberal. We've got a link up to it on our website. Everybody panic, rush out and buy it immediately. Uh, Paul, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's uh, uh, good to have you here. So first, you know, a lot of this book is about history and how we got to where we are today in America. I want to set that up for people before we start a discussion. And I told people uh, ahead of time that you're going to try to bring me more to the light. <laughs> right, yes. Because economically, I'm still centrist. We'll see how we define that a little bit later. Uh, but first, how did the welfare state start in America, How did it get, and how do we get to where we are today? Okay, so... We had this thing called the Great Depression. Uh, which that didn't was, work uh, out well, no. It didn't work out so well. And, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is my great hero in this book, uh, said, you know, we, we've always known that the heedless pursuit of self-interest was bad morals. Now we know that it's bad economics, too. And so he uh, uh, passed, you know, it's, it's a whole set of things that, that took place. Social Security uh, is the, you know, the... the uh, the crown jewel of, of what he created, but he created uh, unemployment insurance, minimum wages, uh, strong policies to support union organizing, progressive taxation, so quite high rates on, on high incomes. Uh, so, so anyway, um, all of this produced something which you don't usually learn about in high school, which was not just the Great Depression, but what the economic historians call the Great Compression, uh, a big narrowing. Of, of income differentials, we became a much more equal society. Not, you know, not Cuba, but a much more equal society, uh, where working men and women uh, had incomes that were put them into the middle class. Um, that's the society I grew up in. It's the society of the post-war generation. You know, I'm a horrible baby boomer, and uh, and it was an incredibly successful system. Uh, we had uh, 25 years of the greatest prosperity the world has ever seen. Tremendous increase in incomes, family, you know, all the it's wonderful uptick. Um, beginning in the 1970s, that system was slowly taken apart. Uh, the 70s were a bit of a troubled economic decade, but the, the main point is that um, conservative uh, right-wing political forces gained the upper hand in the United States. The minimum wage was allowed to erode. Uh, the Department of Labor, especially under Ronald Reagan, basically declared open season on labor unions, so the unions were, were busted to a fraction of their former size. Uh, the uh, tax, taxes on the rich were cut. Uh, they tried several times to un undo Social Security. They tried to undo Medicare, but uh, that didn't succeed. But, but overall, you have this whole series of things that, that took it apart, and what we've seen is a return uh, in not in all respects, but in in many of the ways to the, to the Gilded Age, we're back to being an extremely unequal society. Um, and the way I would put it right now is the the astonishing fact from an economic point of view is this: there's a big debate among economists about whether American families are better off. The typical American family is better off or worse off than it was in the early 1970s. You don't need to know the outcome of that debate. It, it's it's technical. It's not you know. But the point is that we're even having that debate. Right, 35 years ago, uh, no personal computers, no internet, no fax machines, no cell phones, no uh, uh, you know, no barcode scanners, no freight containerization. So we're an enormously richer society, but we're not sure that that has trickled down to the middle class at all because there's been such an increase in inequality, such a surge in income at the top that's all gone to a handful of very rich people. We're talking to Paul Krugman. He wrote the book The Conscious of a Liberal, and that what he just explained in about a minute and a half there is explained thoroughly in the book, the history of it, and it's very, very interesting. It g explains how we got to where we are. Now, I want to ask you, before 1973, when we really hit our peak uh, in a lot of ways, we've got equality of income, yet we have terrific uh, rise in our level of income. Right. Uh, what do you think was the single biggest factor? Of course, there's not one single factor that does it all, but the biggest factor that led to such good results. Oh, I think it was, <clears throat> I mean, mostly it was technology, right? You know, always technology is advancing, but it was a society in which people were, uh, the incentives were good enough to make people want to work. Uh, there was all, I can talk about things that didn't happen. Um, corporate malfeasance, such a big story these days, was l really minimal. Uh, for one thing, you know, CEOs, because you couldn't make off with $100 million, it actually was uh, paid to, to, to behave like someone who actually had the interest of the corporation at stake. Um, there was a, a lot of cooperation on, on, the, on the labor front. You know, unions basically, there's something that we call the Treaty of Detroit, 
was originally the auto workers with the auto companies, but eventually spread in effect to a lot of the workplace, where the union said, look, you can go ahead and raise efficiency. We want wage security and benefits in return. It turned out to be a pretty good thing. And of course, education, lots of people, the level of education of the population rose a lot. It, the main point, I think, is it showed that you can have a society that is not, doesn't have the huge inequalities of the Gilded Age before the, you know, before the 30s or the society we live in now, and it still works really well. Uh, Paul, I wanted to ask, look, I, I'm a former moderate conservative back when there was such a thing. And uh, nowadays I've, you know, obviously completely abandoned the Republican Party because they, in, as a, a lot of Christine Todd Whitman says and, and many others say, they abandoned us. Although Christine Todd Whitman is not very reliable in that sense. Right. Uh, but uh, but I, I'm not a politician. I was never went to the Republican Party. My uncle wasn't in it. You know, it made sense back in the 80s and 90s to me. I don't know if I was wrong about that. You're going to tell me in a second. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I, so I wonder, you know, especially economically speaking, I wonder if there's a, a balance to be had here. You know, in the book you talk about how the welfare state has done a lot of great things for America, and the things that you state I don't really disagree with. I think it has. I think you know the equalization of of, of incomes was very positive. Uh, the productivity through a long period after the war was obviously very positive. But is there a limit to the welfare state? Oh sure. Look, if I'm in Germany. I start to sound like an ugly American, right? In Germany, to protect the workers, the stores are closed on the weekend. The, the uh, you know, there's there, the, uh, the the unemployment benefits. Uh, they've improved this a bit. For for a while, the unemployment benefits were so good that there really wasn't much point in working. You know, you can you can get to a situation of having a welfare state that that really kills all incentives. But we are so far from that. The United mm -hmm. States is, you know, we we have our, our there are there are some things that are just pure win, like having universal health care that every other advanced country has. It's actually cheaper than the U.S. system where insurance companies spend lots of money to, to screen out people who are likely to have high medical costs. Um, so that, you know, things like that the U.S. doesn't do. And if you want to, look, if we wanted to get up, if, if, if we got to a Canadian level of taxation, a, a Canadian level of welfare state, which is still less than European, then I might say, okay, now let's have a discussion about whether we want to go further. But the U.S. is just completely off the charts in terms of doing so little for people in trouble. So you're saying in uh, domestic policy, as we have in foreign policy, the country has moved so far to the right that moving it further to the left, you're in no danger of going past the middle. Not, not, uh, not for these next three presidential cycles at the minimum. It's just not, not a chance. No, we, 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 a really hard right movement, movement conservatism, which is what the movement conservatives themselves call it, took over the Republican Party, uh, hijacked a lot of U.S. policy, and we have moved in a way we're just nothing like, we don't look like other advanced countries. We're somewhere halfway between a, a, a civilized country and Brazil. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Let me, so let me give you three specific examples from the 80s and 90s, and let's talk around right. this. Um, when Reagan came into office, the top marginal income uh, tax rate was 70%. Yeah. Do you agree that that was too high? Probably, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, it's probably counterproductive to make it that high, although it wasn't crippling. You know, we did fine. You know, back when that socialist Dwight Eisenhower was president, we had the top rate was 91 percent, and the economy mm -hmm. was booming. So, uh, uh, but no, I mean, I, w I would say 70 is probably high, but but not drastically high. Oh, we did terrific under Bill Clinton, and the tax rate was much lower. The top rate was yeah, but it was it was you know higher was, than it is now. It was 39.6 under right, Bill Clinton. Right, 39.6. So that's about a 30 point difference, which is quite substantial. Do you have a sense of you know? Obviously, you're an economist. Do you have a sense of where the top rate should be? Well, look, some Britain is doing pretty well, and they've got a it's a complicated system, but it amounts to a rate that's somewhere uh, uh, a little bit north of fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I they, they you can't just give a you know you can't tell me what the rate should be until you know you need to figure out what you need to pay for it's it, there's a trade off between the programs you need to finance and the but the point is even seventy wasn't killing even you know the U S was not a a derelict economy when it was seventy I don't think we need seventy. But, uh, but, but you 50, think we do need about 50? Yeah, I think in the end we're going to have to get there to pay for the things we need. Okay. Uh, second uh, situation, Clinton comes in and does welfare reform. Um, now, as at the time, as a conservative, I like that, and I think that opens my mind to, hey, maybe these Democrats aren't so bad. And he balanced the budget, which I also like. Uh, am I wrong, uh, or was welfare reform overall positive? It's not clear. I mean, the welfare reform, a lot of what it did was just sweep problems under the bed. I mean, basically, a lot of people who were getting welfare are now just as desperate as they were before, but they're not getting the money. So um, the, the main reason for it was a good idea for Clinton to do welfare reform was just to take the issue off the table because the amount of mileage 
that the uh, that the right got off the you know welfare cheats. Ronald Reagan with his welfare queen driving Cadillac. It never happened, but that the idea that that these people were ripping us off for vast sums of money was a big problem. But you know, it, it, welfare has never been a really big issue monetarily. What, what we call welfare, the, the big money has always been in Medicare and Social Security. Uh, and so it's not a big deal in terms of money. I think the welfare reform caused a lot of silent suffering from people we don't hear from. That's uh, uh, the, but you know, I, I don't get much worked up about it one way or the other. We're talking to Paul Krugman. He's, of course, an editorial columnist for the New York Times, and he's written the book, The Conscience of a Liberal. We have a link on our website, theyoungturks.com, where you can uh, buy the book from Amazon. Uh, Paul, let's, you know, I was worried not so much about the cost of of welfare at the time, because I realized it was a small, tiny part of the budget, yeah. and a tiny part of the quote-unquote welfare state even. Uh, so within the welfare structure, what we call welfare was really not that large a percentage. But what I was worried about was the wrong incentives that it gave people, and that I thought it created a dependency, and that it was counterproductive to the people you were trying to help. Did, did you also have those concerns? Well, that's always, that's always a concern, right? You worry about any government program that provides aid that uh, because the aid you know, if it's means tested, if the aid gets cut off as as your your income goes up, it's some disincentive to improve yourself. And now the thing is, that, but if we actually look at the welfare, you know, I don't want to get too much into welfare reform. It, it's it, that's a complicated issue. It's it happens to be one of the more and you know, it's not welfare was never my favorite program as as it existed. It's not great now. In some ways, it's it's very cruel. But you know, the big stuff is again, it's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and those are the ones that you know. Let's put it this way. Um, S chip. Mm -hmm. uh, if you thought that that the Republicans were concerned about welfare because of the incentive effects, think about S chip. It's not that's not what it's about. They just really hate the idea of helping people. All right, so let's talk about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It's obviously a, a very large cost that's only going to get larger, and we were supposed to save up for it and have this huge right. surplus that was going to kick in now. Except, oops, we spent it all. Well, we we gave it away. The tax cuts are still bigger than the Iraq War, even now, even this year. We're gonna, you know, the 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 Bush tax cuts are gonna contribute more to the uh, to the budget deficit than the Iraq War will. So you have right. to bear in mind where it went. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, you know, uh, people say a lot of negative things about Reagan on the domestic front. Some of which I agree with, some of which I don't agree with. But Reagan, after he did the initial tax cuts, raised taxes 11 times. So he was a lot more flexible than Bush's. I mean, can you yeah. imagine Bush raising taxes 11 times? Yeah. Although, yeah. I mean, although Reagan, what Reagan did do was he cut taxes, cut income taxes, which is the tax that is the main tax that wealthy people pay. And then he raised the payroll tax, which is the main tax that 86% of, of workers pay. So, well, they had it coming. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, we did spend a surplus. So what are we going to do in the future? If Paul Krugman was president or was advisor to the president, what would you tell the president? Right. When you see this thing, you see these Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, there is no program called Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It's Social Security is a moderate-sized problem, not a, not, a, not a really big deal. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid is driven mostly not by aging population, but by health care costs. Give me real health care reform, and the whole thing shrinks to manageable size. If uh, you know, I can be economistic here, I say if, if, if we can just make it a demographic problem as opposed to a health care inflation problem, then we're talking 3 to 4% of GDP, which is something which we can close with some combination of, of tax increases, uh, maybe some, some change in the, in the definition of the benefits. Not, not a, you know, a problem of a size that advanced countries have often dealt with without, without much trouble. Don't deal with health care costs. Well, we're in deep yogurt. But the, the problem actually comes far before we have a problem with Medicare. The problem comes with the collapse of the private health insurance system. So health care, give me health care reform. We have to have that. And the whole thing becomes more manageable. So I say, you know, that my answer to the problem of the budget is actually health care. That's interesting. And what kind of health care reform? I know this is a large question that right. we can we have to boil down as much as we can. What kind of health care reform do you envision that could help to fix that problem? Well, ideally, ideally, uh, Medicare for all, which ends up actually reducing the cost of Medicare. It's a bit complicated, but it makes it makes the. Uh, how does it do that? I, I'm, I'm always curious about that. Talk to a doctor's office about how they, where 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 his expenses come from. Uh, or her expenses. Typically, doctors have to have lots of people dealing with all of the claims from different insurance companies, justifying, fighting. There's a whole industry called denial management, which is what you do when the insurance company denies payment. Uh, the, but if the government is running it, don't they have to deny cl some claims as well? Many fewer, because they're they're not fighting over whether this person is really entitled to be covered, because 
if you know it Medicaid. but then we got to pay for their expenses yeah but you talked again the 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 administrative costs the overhead of medicare is 3% of its budget the overhead of private insurance companies is 14% of their budget doctors find it much easier to deal with medicare than they do with private insurance companies and then there's the international evidence other countries uh you know the the french system delivers excellent care and it costs about 65 cents for every dollar we spend uh, per person. So there's a lot of evidence that we could just save a lot of money. Now, you know, there, there may be all, there are ultimate larger issues about, in the end, how far do we go in medical care? What do you do for really, you know, small chance, very expensive treatments? But those, you know, those, we're so far from being efficient that we can put those decisions off in the U.S. Well, you know, some people are worried about it. And honestly, I'm a little worried about it because I got all worked up by the Michael Moore movie and I was like, God, that makes sense and what he yeah. said is true. And then I went to the post office and it took forever to get 20 stamps. And the people there were so unbelievably unmotivated. And I remembered why I used to be a conservative. And so I thought, are these going to be the same people that run our health care system? Except, well, after you picked the wrong post office. Uh, I, and, and have you never been in a private, you know, have you ever been trying to get your fours filled out? I don't know, but Paul, then I went to the DMV, and it didn't get any better, it got worse. Well, you no, know? that's just bad government then, because actually the, my DMV is quite, is, is quite efficient, I'll mm -hmm. tell you. Uh, but, no, it's a real, no, I mean, bureaucracies can be inefficient, but there's, you know, we're, we really are talking about large bureaucracies, and there isn't that much difference between private and public. Um, and this idea, look, the, this notion that the private sector is always more efficient than the government. In healthcare, we know that that's exactly wrong. There's not a single case I'm aware of in which private insurance doesn't cost more than having the government provide the health care. Uh, there are a lot of other things. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Bush administration keeps on trying to privatize services, and they set up this procedure where, you know, they have to compete on costs with the existing civil service. And they've had to rig the competition in order to get the private sector to win a significant number of those competitions because it turns out that they usually are less efficient because private companies spend money on marketing. and So, no, I mean, th there are things I don't want. I don't want collective farms, right? <laughs> I, See, that's why I wanted to ask you. Where do we draw the line? Because there's things that are obvious that we all, I think, reasonable people agree on. It, it, you know, should uh, the fire department be privatized? Absolutely not. Although L.A. in some communities are doing that, Bel Air, et cetera, which is outrageous. You, you, you've got this notion of reasonable people, which doesn't cover the people. You know, should the, should the army be privatized? And Blackwater. I, I know Blackwater, and they're so, doing uh, it. So I'm putting the movement conservatives because I think they're insane. You describe them well in the book. Yeah, but they're running um, the world. You know, I, so. I know, I know, and we're going to fight them, and we're going to beat them. Okay. That's my assumption, and I believe that. I'm talking about the post-conservative movement world where reasonable oh. people try to reach agreement. So we know some things are, that the government does better, the police, fire, et cetera, and we know that private corporations do other things better. You know, you don't want privatized farm. I'm sorry, public farms, et cetera, as you were saying. So where do we draw the line, Paul? How do oh, we know? Oh, it's, you know, it's case by case. There's, there's no, it, it's, we found that the governments tend to do a pretty bad job of running factories. They do a bad job of running farms. They do a pretty good job of running health insurance systems. Uh, there are some other things we don't know, which, you know, I, uh, mostly, look, uh, t take countries that, someplace like Sweden. They've got a very extensive welfare state, but very little part, very little government ownership of industry. They found out that that doesn't work. So fine, you know, it, it's, but it's, I'd like to make it relatively non-ideological. If we can get a broad agreement on what the government is supposed to do in terms of people's lives, then the question of what's actually owned by the government is something that the parties can hash out, not on the basis of abstract principles, but hey, let's look at this and see if it works. In this segment, let me ask you one more question about that. Let's come back to the movement conservatives. Isn't that part of how the country balances itself out? Like, theoretically, smart people get around the room and figure out what's right and what industries make sense for the government to run and which industries should be private. But that's not how the real world works. It's uh, this giant political battle. So in the beginning, the New Deal wins. Then to balance it out, the conservative movements win. And then hopefully Paul Krugman wins, and that's the way the no. merry round goes around. No, because in fact the movement conservatives never won elections based on their economic ideas. Really never. Uh, one of the themes of Conscience of a Liberal is that the way they win is always through weapons of mass distraction, by changing the subject. And above all, although national security and stuff like that has happened, but above all uh, by exploiting racial tension. <laughs> uh, so 
we we would have been better off if the Reagans and all those who yes. never came in the first. No, place. if we if we had Eisenhower Republicans all the way through. I don't want Democrats running the country always, but if we'd had Eisenhower Republicans or Schwarzenegger Republicans, is I think where we will eventually end up. Ah, then we would have had a no. That, so you think uh, I'm going to squeeze one more question in? Do you think that the the current uh, spate of uh, I don't know if that's a slate I should say of radical Republicans are eventually going to die out because of the electoral I, I think their movement is uh, in its last throes. And, and you think that the Schwarzenegger Republicans are going to come in and replace it? Only after a couple of big national defeats, but yes, I think that's where it's going. I, 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 it's going to be the 50s all over again. All right, while we have you here, i got to ask you. So uh, I thought Reagan was a good guy when I was growing up, but then I was a kid. You know, He came yeah. into office in 1980. I was 10 years old. What do I know? Right. And it turns out he gave a, a speech in Philadelphia, Mississippi, uh, right. Ra Reagan, uh, Reagan was a race baiter uh, all through his career, at least up until he reached the White House. He, uh, um, he, you know, he ran against the welfare queen with her Cadillac. He, uh, and he, this is one of the most spectacularly evil, I can say, things to do. He, he began his 1980 campaign not with tax cuts, not with communism, but by going to Philadelphia, M Mississippi, where civil rights workers were murdered in 1980, and uh, giving a speech in favor of states' rights. It's a clear shout-out. To the to Southern segregationists, and you know, yeah. I found out about that Philadelphia, Mississippi speech a couple of months ago, and I all my life I didn't know about it. Yeah. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, he was a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, well, look, it's 1964. The speech that made him a national figure, speech for Goldwater. He made fun of John F. Kennedy, who said that millions of Americans go to bed hungry every night, and Reagan said, ah, they were probably all on a diet. Now, this is a really heartless guy played on people's fears. Now, that being said, Paul. Uh, Here's a guy who, as we talked about before, raised taxes 11 times. Here's a guy who negotiated with the Soviet Union, didn't bomb them, didn't attack them. When he got bombed in Lebanon, he, he, he That's left. right. No, in office, he was not crazy. He was not, he, you know, as governor of California, he was actually a, a reasonable administrator, too. So his, his political persona was evil, basically. But, but that's as, how he got elected, but that's right. not necessarily that's right. how he governed. Yeah, actually, you might say the same thing about George H.W. Bush, that he ran... You know, he, he he ran his election on Willie Horton, evil again. But then, right. but then actually in in office behaved more or less reasonably. So it wasn't until we got George W. Bush that we got someone who governed just as he. Uh, actually, he did the opposite. George W. Bush ran as a moderate, at least in 2000, and then then you know uh, produced what we all see. Yeah, no, it is absolutely interesting. Nobody ever says, "Hey, George H. W. Bush and George W. Bush have diametrically opposed foreign policies." H. W. Bush, New World Order. Nobody attacks. Does first strikes. Yeah. His son comes in and says, "We do first strikes." Yeah. And so I actually, to this day, I think foreign policy-wise, George H. Bush, W. Bush was a very good president. Am, am I wrong about that? He was reasonable. I mean, he didn't do any. You know, it, yeah, he did the Gulf War pretty well. He was, uh, yeah, no, no, uh, no, no problems. If we got about thirty seconds left, Paul. If you could pick the next president out of our Democratic candidate, not allowed. Times rules. Oh, not allowed. Okay. But no, look, it, I, I'm a progressive. Uh, John Edwards has been pushing the progressive cause. All of the other leading Democrats, Hillary has been essentially matching him with a lag. It's you know, it, it's I, sometimes I pinch myself. The, the policy proposals are better than I could have imagined possible two years ago. Oh, interesting on health care, et cetera. Yeah. And so you're happy with the way it's developing. Are you a little scared, 10 seconds or less, of Hillary Clinton's governing if she yes, wins? Yes, I'm afraid. I think she would win, but then I'm afraid she would triangulate into oblivion. We're all afraid of that. Paul Krugman, the book is The Conscious of a Liberal. Everybody panic, run, go get it right now.